Perhaps I should start out with just some basics of good grafting technique. Um, if you've never grafted, you may not be aware of what it takes to do a good job of grafting. And most people, the first time they try grafting something, they fail. And I think that's often because they don't understand what really is required there. So the first thing you really need is a very sharp knife. Some people use a razor blade or an exacto knife with a new blade in it. Uh, I use an actual grafting knife. Uh, but whatever kind of uh, blade you're using, you want it to be literally razor sharp. I always test my grafting knife on my arm and see if I can shave a bit of hair off uh, before I graft. And if it doesn't shave cleanly, then I need to go and sharpen the knife before I even go on. Working with a dull knife, even a knife that by pocket knife standards you might say is fairly sharp, uh, just won't work as well. Here is some of the equipment you'll need for grafting. Um, we use Lysol spray to sterilize our tools. You could dip them in a, a container of rubbing alcohol, uh, but in some way it's a good idea to sterilize them. Um, if you don't have any disease problems in your garden, that may not be a problem, but if you're concerned about spreading crown gall, for example, uh, it, it, there probably is wisdom in sterilizing your tools. Of course, we're gonna use a regular pruning type clipper and then a grafting knife. Grafting knives are different from regular pocket knives or kitchen knives in that they are only sharpened on one side of the blade, which means they have handedness to them. The one on the left here is a left-handed grafting knife, and um, it's a folding knife from Tina, and so you can tell by the thumb notch there that I'm holding it in the correct hand because I can see the, the notch. If I flipped it over, so the notch is on the back side, that says I'm holding it the wrong way. Um, and in this case, the beveled edge, the ground edge, is on the top, and the other side is just flat, not ground at all. Whereas on this right-handed knife, the opposite is the case. This is, this is uh, if I'm holding it in my left hand because I'm holding the camera, but uh, this is um, being held as if it were in a right hand, and you can see that the uh, side of the blade facing us is the one that has been ground, the back side is flat. That gives you a much cleaner, better grafting cut, but it does mean that you need to use a knife that is designed for whichever hand is your dominant hand. I happen to be a lefty. To wrap a graft, you can use almost any material that will seal the wounds and hold them together. And uh, in ancient times, they used straw and camel dung and various other materials. Um, in the 21st century, we tend to use one of several things. On the left, we have grafting rubber strips. Those we buy from AM Lettered Company, and they are uh, vulcanized rubber that has way too much sulfur added to it. So it's the kind of the opposite of a truck tire where you want ultraviolet protection so it doesn't rot in the sun. In this case, uh, this rubber is going to rot in the sun fairly quickly. So from a commercial nursery standpoint, that means you can wrap a graft and three or four weeks later, the rubber band just kind of decays away and falls off all by itself. It saves some labor. If you're just doing this as a backyard gardener, you may or may not care about that, but it's certainly one of the possibilities. The other two rolls of tape then are uh, polyethylene tape, uh, half inch grafting tape. The one in the middle is a regular grafting tape. It's quite a bit thicker than the one on the right, which is known as chip budding tape. And so depending on what kind of graft I'm using, I'll choose one or the other of those. If I'm chip budding, I will nearly always use the one on the right. Uh, if I'm cleft grafting or veneer grafting, I'll use the one in the middle. On your knife blade, so here's the handle over here, here's the blade, this is the sharp edge. There is a tendency among beginning grafters to just push the blade through the plant tissue they're using. So they may only use that much of the blade and they're just doing a, a vertical push. Alternatively, some people will saw the blade back and forth like a saw blade and, and you end up then with a zigzaggy cut. Neither one of those makes a very clean, good quality grafting cut. What you'd like to do is start at the base of the blade and as you cut through the tissue that you're, that you're uh, trimming, you'd like to slide the blade in a single clean slice using as much of that blade as you can. And the better you get at that long um, sweeping slice, the more likely you are to be successful. 
Another thing to consider in grafting in general is that you're cutting tissue open. It's really a form of surgery, and unless you're in an area with 100% humidity, which you're probably not, um, that tissue can dry up fairly quickly. So it's important to be able to work quickly. The more time between cuts that you leave, the less likely your graft is to be successful. And that's one of the things that just practice makes perfect. You need to try over and over until you can make good cuts consistently and quickly. And there's the other part. You need really good cuts. You want no waviness, no splinters. Um, uh, you want the cuts on your scion and on your rootstock to match up more or less perfectly. And to be able to do that, perfect cuts, in minimal time, there's no substitute for just a lot of practice to make that happen. Some terminology in a grafted plant, you have the base of the plant, which is making the root system. That's known as the rootstock, or the understock, or a lot of people just call it the stock. And then above the graft, you have the variety, whether that's an apple tree or an orange tree or a rose bush. And that part is uh, genetically different from what's down here, where actually it's almost like an organ transplant in humans. If you get a kidney transplant with somebody else's kidney, we're taking the top of one rose bush and we're giving it a new, different root system that will, in some way, perform differently or hopefully better than its own roots would have. And so that top part is known as the scion, S-C-I-O-N, and in modern English we say that word scion. And then the place where the two join together, where the actual surgery was performed, is known as the union or the graft union. Or if you're using one of the bud grafting methods, you may call it the bud union. For all practical purposes, they're the same thing. It's just the scar where the two pieces of tissue came together. And on a rose, that tends to remain visible throughout the lifetime of the, of the plant. Often the scion will grow uh, faster than the rootstock, and you'll end up with something that looks kind of like this, where, it, it, uh, where the, the uh, scion dramatically overgrows the top, and you've got this knobby looking thing, almost like a fist on top of the rootstock. Uh, not all plants do that, but roses do tend to do that. 